Hey everyone, this is Tammy Painter, and you're listening to the Book Owl Podcast, the podcast where I entertain your inner book nerd with tales of quirky books and literary lore. And while I usually try to keep things light and fun on this show, today we're going to get a little somber with a story of a very special, very inspiring book written by a young girl who had great hopes for her future. Now, because this is a more serious show, I'm not going to sully it with any sponsorship stuff, but I do want to say thanks to everyone who has been listening to the show. I, I really, I love delving into these stories about books and libraries and reading and literacy and stuff like that, and it's, it's really humbling that you're actually listening to them. And while I'm giving thanks, I just want to give a ginormous amount of thank yous to Helen Crawford, who mentioned the show on her blog a couple weeks ago. Helen, well, Helen makes monsters, and I'm going to put a link in the show notes because you have to check her creations out. Each one of her hand-knit, she calls them beasties. Each one of these beasties, of which I have three, is unique and made of high-quality materials, and the amount of work and detail she puts into each one just, it absolutely blows my mind. So do be sure to check out her site, but be warned, because once you invite a beastie into your life, things will never be the same. Also, I know a few of you over on Twitter have been sharing the podcast with others, and that's really brought a huge grin to my face, as have the unexpected comments about my speaking voice, which is absolutely bizarre, because I'm going to be honest, I hate my voice, and that really held me back from starting this podcast. So these compliments have felt really, really weird and really unexpected and have, honestly, they've given me a huge boost for this endeavor. Anyway, as ever, if you like the show, I'd love it if you just told one other person about it. All right, um, enough babbling. It's time to put a somber expression on the book Al's beak. So I'm releasing this episode on the 11th of June, but it's actually in honor of a certain book that was given on the 12th of June, 1942, to a girl on her 13th birthday. Now, the thing about this book is when she got it, the pages were completely blank. But that only lasted for a couple days when she jotted down a single sentence expressing her hope that the book would be a great support to her. And the book did provide a good amount of support for, you know, her teenage emotions and what was going on in her life. And although her writing career was cut brutally short after only a couple years, her words continue to inspire people from across the globe. The girl, as you might have guessed, was Anne Frank, and the book in question would become her diary and a record of her life trying to be normal under very abnormal circumstances. And unfortunately, hate and utter cruelty would put an early end to her life. So Anne Frank was Jewish, and she was born in 1929 in Frankfurt, Germany. And this was right around the period when Germany was just, they were absolutely reeling from their defeat uh, in World War I. Their economy had tanked, and the Nazis were rising to power under the leadership of a rabble-rousing racist rogue named Adolf Hitler. So basically, Anne was born in both a really bad time and a really bad place to be Jewish. Um, Because they didn't like the vibe in Germany and because the German economy was doing so poorly, Anne's parents, who are named Otto and Edith, decided to move to Amsterdam, which is a good plan because Amsterdam is a great city. Unfortunately, Hitler's army showed up there in 1940 and started throwing its weight around, including putting severe restrictions on Jews. Then in, this was early 1942, I think it was March, Anne's older sister Margot gets a letter telling her she's been recruited for work at a special camp. Yeah, so basically it was the phishing spam email of the day. And just like any savvy person, Otto and Edith weren't buying this ruse. The trouble was is that they couldn't leave the Netherlands because of those um, those restrictions I just mentioned. So Otto, again, seeing what's about to happen, begins remodeling the attic of his business on Prinsengracht. Oh, and Prinsengracht is a street in Amsterdam, by the way, just in case you were wondering. And one June day, his daughter Anne picks out a journal which she's given as a birthday gift. About a month after she gets this book, 
Otto's family, which were himself, Edith, Margot, and Anne, and four other people enter this small remodeled attic that would end up being their home for the next two years. And during this time, Anne writes in her journal. And boy, does she write. She ends up filling most of the diary, then continues on filling up notebooks given to her by Margot. So when Anne first starts writing in this diary, she's she's basically she's writing to a bunch of imaginary friends. And one of these imaginary friends, she names Kitty. Well, apparently Kitty was the cat's meow because it's not long after Anne begins writing to her that Anne is solely writing to Kitty and dreaming of hanging out with her in Switzerland, which was neutral at the time. And, you know, she's imagining them going skating together, starring in a film, and I imagine giggling over a lot of boys. So I know this is going to exclude a few people out there, but anyone who has been a teenage girl knows that you have thoughts and feelings that you just have to get out or you will burst. And of course, you can't tell anyone those feelings. I mean, they wouldn't understand. So the only way you can get these feelings out is to commit them to paper. Anne was no different. And this seems to be the primary reason she started her diary. And keep in mind, like I said, she just turned 13 the month before they entered the attic. And if you ever have looked at the diary itself, she does fill the pages with a lot of you know, kind of grumpiness about her mom. She's got a big old crush on one of the boys in the attic. And, you know, she's just dealing with a lot of stuff besides being locked in an attic and not knowing what's going to happen next. But we don't really remember Anne as, or Anne Frank's diary as being full of teenage angst. What we think of is her account of her daily life in the attic. And that's mainly because she wrote kind of like two different versions of her diary. So what inspired this, I guess we'll call it a secondary work? Well, we have the Dutch minister to thank for that. Um, the government minister, not religious minister. So Anne and her family and the four others have been in the attic for nearly two years. So it's March 1944, and the Dutch minister puts out a radio call asking his people to keep a record of what is happening to them so they'll be able to document the events and the emotions and just people's actions during the German occupation. And when Anne got word of this request, she set to work pouring over her all the journals she'd been keeping and rewriting portions of it and basically making them into a new text that would end up being called the Secret Annex. During this rewrite, Anne did plenty of self-editing. And since she was, you know, by now she was the ripe old age of 15, she cast a pretty critical eye over what the 13-year-old Anne had written. Um, the 15-year-old Anne worked in some missing details, and she also decided to leave out a few details, such as her burning crush for Peter, which was one of the um, other people in the attic. Um, she also left out some very teenage comments about her mom, including, my mother is in most things an example to me, but then it's an example of precisely how I shouldn't do things. Oh, man, Anne, that was mean. I couldn't find information about exactly when Anne completed her rewrite, but in August 1944, Anne, her family, the four others in the attic, and the people who helped them were arrested during a Nazi raid of the premises. Following the arrest, Anne and hundreds of others were crammed into train cars for the three-day journey to Auschwitz. And I know it doesn't get all that hot in the Netherlands, but this was August, and that is a lot of bodies crammed together. It was likely incredibly hot and miserable, as well as terrifying, because by this point, they knew exactly what happened to Jews who entered Auschwitz. Of the hundreds of people on that train, 350 were immediately sent to the gas chamber upon arrival at Auschwitz. Anne and her family were 
they were strong and healthy enough not to be put to death and instead were selected for labor. Her dad went to a men's camp and she and her mom and sister went to the women's camp. And I suppose there's some solace that can be taken in that, that at least they were allowed to be kept together, those three. But sadly, even mom and daughters wouldn't be allowed to stay together. And a couple months later, Edith was kept at Auschwitz while Margot and Anne were sent off to Bergen-Belsen. And this is in October of 1944. Even worse, Edith would die at Auschwitz only weeks before the camp was liberated. I told you this was not going to be a cheery episode. At Bergen-Belsen, the cold, wet, cramped conditions of winter and the severe lack of food left Margot and Anne susceptible to disease, and they both died of typhus in February of 1945. Of the eight people that were in the attic, Otto would be the only one to survive. When the camp was liberated, and the camp, I'm pretty sure it was Auschwitz, when it was liberated, he weighed only 52 kilos which is about 114 pounds, and he could barely walk. So remember when I mentioned the raid and the eight people being arrested, but also the people that helped the Franks were arrested? Well, they they weren't Jewish. They were Dutch citizens, and they were eventually freed, and two of them, named Miep Gies and Bep Voskiel, they found Anne's diaries, and Miep held on to them, hoping that one day she would be able to give them back to Anne. Instead, she ended up having to give them to Otto. As you can imagine, Otto was really torn. He he wanted to read Anne's words to bring his daughter back to life in some way, but it was also painfully hard for him to read those words. It took a while, but he did eventually read the diaries, and he couldn't believe how strong her writing was. He was quoted as saying, The Anne that appeared before me was very different from the daughter I had lost. I had had no idea of the depth of her thoughts and feelings. Like any proud papa, Otto showed his daughter's work to a few family members, and those family members ended up showing it to a few friends, who then encouraged Otto to compile them into a formal book and told him he should publish them because these were important words that needed to be read by others. And so... In 1947, The Secret Annex was published. Anne, she would have been 18 at the time. Upon its publication, Otto said, how proud Anne would have been if she had lived to see this. Because apparently in March of 1944, she had written in her diary, imagine how interesting it would be if I published a novel about The Secret Annex. Yeah, it turns out all Anne was able to do was imagine. Uh, Because of hatred, Anne's life ended painfully early, but because of a few brave people, she was able to live long enough to tell an amazing story that would impact thousands upon thousands of lives for years to come. And while this episode is about Anne Frank and her diary, because it's a book, I also think it's important to remember the people who helped her and her family. I mean, these people stuck their necks out to help, knowing full well that they risked being arrested and sent to the concentration camps for doing so. So while Anne Frank's name is famous, it's important to remember those who did their best to keep her and her family alive. And they include Miep Gies, her husband Jan Gies, Victor Kugler, Johannes Kleiman, Johann Voskul, and his mom Bet Voskul. And yeah, I don't know where to go from here. Just stop hating, stop giving voice to people who spread hate and incite violence, and do your best to be tolerant. You don't have to love everybody, but just be tolerant and a little bit compassionate. And I'm going to wrap up the episode with one final quote from Anne, which I think says it all. What is done cannot be undone, but one can prevent it from happening again. Okay, everyone. Thanks for listening, and I promise a little bit more fun and giggles in the next episode. Since this is already a longer episode than normal, I'll skip the personal update. However, I do want to say that I'd love to hear from you. If you have a favorite book or book-related topic you want me to explore, don't be shy about suggesting it for a future show. 
Because while I have tons of ideas, I'm always open to new ones. Um, the best way to get in touch with me is at thebookowlpodcast.com slash contact. And as ever, if you've liked what you heard, please do subscribe to the show. And if you want to get more out of every episode, join the flock by signing up for the Book Owl Podcast newsletter. And as ever, all the links you need will be in the show notes. All right, everyone, have a great week and or a great couple weeks, that is. And I will hoot at you later. The Book Owl Podcast is a production of Daisy Dog Media. Copyright 2020. All rights reserved. The theme music was composed by Kevin McLeod.